Are hexagons actually the best of guns? Should I cut my hair and stop worrying about a two-year-old rhyming geometry video? And of course, is this video another excuse for me to create physics simulations and show you cool animations? So if YouTube has somehow directed you to my channel, I can almost guarantee that you watch CGP Grey, and specifically you have seen his iconic video Hexagons are the best guns. Now, I watched this video when it came out, I liked it, but one thing stuck with me. One of the arguments that Gray makes is that hexagons are the strongest shape, and that's why they are the best shape. Which is surprising, because it's pretty common knowledge that triangles are actually the strongest shape. But somehow, this is not the first time I've seen this misconception, so I figured I'd make a video about it. Now, I don't know where this came from. Maybe it has something to do with hexagons being new in space age, and triangles are old school and you use them on steam train bridges. But the engineers who made steam train bridges knew a thing or two about the strength of materials. So right away, let's just talk about some basics of materials and strength. There's two main ways that we like to load materials. There's tension, which is strong, compression, which can be strong, but if you have too skinny of a member, it will buckle and suddenly it becomes weak. Now this is not actually a compression failure, this is a bending failure, also known as buckling when it's caused by compression. Materials suck at resisting bending. This is terrible. There's no strength at all compared to tension or compression of a shorter, more rigid section. So that's something to keep in mind for the rest of this video. Tension is strong, compression is sort of strong, and bending or buckling is super weak. So I have two ideas of where this misconception might be coming from. The first is what happens in Gray's video, where he talks about graphene being one of the strongest materials. Graphene, of course, is made up of carbon, which forms into hexagons. So graphene is hexagons, graphene is strong, hexagons, bestagons. But it's not quite that simple. This reminds me of a conversation I had with someone at one point where they said that they make carbon nanotubes out of hexagons because hexagons are the strongest shape. Because usually when you see a render of a carbon nanotube, it looks like this perfect little structure. And you might assume it's made out of very tiny carbon fibers, but that's not actually true. This is essentially a molecule. Each of those points at the corners of the hexagon is an atom of carbon. And the members that connect them together are not members at all, they are chemical bonds. So there's really physically nothing there, it's just overlap in electron clouds. So you can't really scale that up to a macro structure and say if you built the same thing out of physical materials it would behave the same as a bunch of atoms which aren't even physically connected. There's just a balance of attractive and repulsive forces keeping them in place. Also, I have to point out that these atoms, while they're most strongly bonded to their neighbors, they're still being influenced by all of their surrounding atoms. So it's not just those 320 degrees separated members, there's also forces coming from across the hexagon that keep it rigid. If you try to collapse the hexagon made out of carbon atoms, the atoms on the opposite sides will push each other apart and expand it back out into a hexagon. The same thing does not happen at the macro scale if we were trying to build a hexagon out of, say, bolted joints. And to demonstrate that, of course, I made my own physics simulation. You can see that when I press play, the hexagon collapses and the neighboring triangle is just fine. This is because of a concept known as static determinants, which don't worry, I'm not gonna get into it too much. I actually made an entire series on this a few years ago. But long story short, for bolted joint type structures, you want to make sure that they're rigid if all of the members maintain the same length, but are free to rotate. Obviously in the hexagon, all of the members are staying the same length, but the joints are able to rotate and there's not enough members to keep it rigid and it collapses. Now, you might be wondering why you don't just strengthen those joints and make them stiff so they can't rotate. And yes, that would work, but it would never be as strong as the triangle, which doesn't need that. And that's because, like I said at the beginning of the video, bending is weak. If you try to fix those joints so they don't rotate, you're placing the joint in bending, and it's gonna fail much earlier than the triangle, which has no bending because it's free to rotate, 
and is purely compression and tension. So to make a macro scale hexagon structurally rigid, you have to add a bunch of members between all of the points, the same way that carbon atoms are actually being repelled by all of their neighbors, not just their two nearest ones. And that looks like this a statically determinant gun. But you'll notice that this has a lot of extra material in it, and unlike the atoms, which do this for free, no extra mass, this would add mass if you tried to make this as a structure. So obviously all of these extra members are gonna make it heavier, just to keep up with the strength of the humble triangle. But maybe we're looking at this wrong. One of the strengths of the hexagon that Gray really likes is that you can tile it. So maybe a single hexagon might be weak, but a bunch of hexagons connected together could be strong. He actually mentions this in his video, saying that the reason that the hexagon is the strongagon is because all of the angles are 120 degrees, meaning they can equally spread the load. Now, I don't buy that oversimplification, but let's run it through my physics simulation and see what happens. Okay, before I click play on my simulation, I'm gonna explain a few things. You can see there's this little plus sign here. That means that point is fixed in X and Y, meaning it can't move at all. And then these red lines at the bottom can slide horizontally, but can't go up or down. Now this is just basic statics engineering. If you over constrain something, you can add extra stress. If you look at bridges even, they will be on literal rollers, which allow them to expand and contract without putting extra stress on the structure. So just imagine that all of these points on the bottom are on rollers. Now we can click play and see what happens and uh, yeah, it, it all falls down. This really shouldn't have been a surprise. We know the hexagons aren't statically determinant, so they're not rigid. And when you put them together, it doesn't really solve that problem because all of the points are free to move, even if the members themselves are rigid. But it does look like something interesting. Once it falls down, it kind of turns into square guns, but it seems to be better in tension. So I set that up here and... Okay. Basically the same thing happens. It turns into square gons for some reason. But, you know, there's still a lot of free moving joints in there. What if I fixed all of the outer sides? Well, it's, it's better, but it's a little messed up at the bottom. This is what I meant by over constraining a structure by having all of the points fixed. You can see there's some like goofy behavior in the bottom. But if I release those bottom points, it actually recovers and turns into a hexagon grid, which seems sort of rigid, except all of the strength here is not coming from the hexagons. It's coming from the fact I'm fixing all of the outer points. What would you fix those outer points with? A statically determinate structure, perhaps one made of triangles. But Gray would be quick to point out that these triangles actually hide hexagons in them. But I would not say that the hexagons are really the backbone of this triangular lattice. Because if you remove the triangles, it all falls apart. You need all of it, you can't just drop a member here or there. Like look at this bridge I simulated. It has this cable on the bottom that keeps everything kind of tight and more rigid, but you can see it's made of triangles and it's pretty sturdy. But if I remove one of the members, the whole thing collapses. You really need the triangles for this to be structurally sound. But of course, if you do constrain the edges, it does become relatively sturdy. And that's why we use it in things like honeycomb paneling. And Gray actually mentions honeycomb paneling in his video as further proof that hexagons are the best hexagons. And this is my second theory on where this misconception comes from. Does the strength of honeycomb paneling truly come from the nature of the hexagon or is it something else? Well, you're probably not surprised that I'm gonna say it comes from somewhere else. In this diagram, the top and bottom sheets are actually where all of the strength of the material is coming from. The hexagons are just spacers to keep them further apart. Spacing materials out makes them much stronger in bending. See this ruler when it's flat bends easily, but if I turn it this way, it's now spread out and much harder to bend. In engineering, we use a lot of I-beams, which use a member like this to space out two plates, and the plates actually carry most of the load. Say it's in bending under its own weight, that will place the top plate in compression and the bottom plate in tension. Remember, compression and tension are strong, and then the middle is in bending, but it's not actually carrying much of the load compared to the top and bottom. That's why it can be much thinner. All it needs to do is keep them spaced apart and prevent the side that's in compression from buckling. Now, yes, we can use hexagons to do this, but we can also use things like foam, which does form somewhat hexagonal patterns, but obviously the foam is very weak. Look at foam board, it's paper, which is floppy, and foam, which is fragile. But when you put them together, it places the paper in tension and compression where it's strong, 
and then the foam just keeps the pieces of paper separated. And then you have a surprisingly sturdy material. Honeycomb is doing the same thing at a slightly higher level. In aerospace, these will be made with sheets of aluminum that are several millimeters thick, meaning they can carry a ton of tension or compression. And then the honeycomb is incredibly thin, so it's very lightweight. And all it's doing is keeping those plates separated and preventing one of them from buckling if it's in compression. But it has very little to do with the hexagon shape itself. So you might ask why we use hexagons at all? And the answer is manufacturability. Just imagine how you could create some of this honeycomb. You take thin sheets of material and lay them on top of each other, and then you glue or weld them together at alternating points, stretch that out, and you have honeycomb. It's that simple. It's a super fast way to make a lightweight material, which is sturdy enough to keep these plates separated, even though on its own, it's very flexible and non-rigid. That's why it's used. Not because it's a strong agon, because it's a simple agon. Just imagine trying to manufacture a different fill shape. It might perform better, but it's gonna be a lot harder to make. You're either gonna have a bunch of tiny pieces which you have to weld together, or you get a giant block of material and you have to mill the shape out of it. That wastes a lot of time, energy, and material. But in aerospace, sometimes that is justified because we really need the weights to be as low as physically possible without compromising strength. So to demonstrate that, I'll reference another viral science communication video where Smarter Every Day toured the ULA rocket factory. You can see these are panels that are gonna be used for Vulcan and they are literally milling a shape out of a big block of aluminum to make the tanks as light but strong as they possibly can. And if you look closely, it's not hexagons, it's squaragons. I know it's not actually squaragons, it's for the bit. This shape specifically gives you the thinnest possible tank wall to reduce weight while still being able to hold in the pressure of the fuel and resist a compressive load from the top from the second stage and payload. That's why there's lines running all the way down to keep the tank from buckling under compression, but it doesn't need to be hexagons, and in fact, they can save a lot of weight by just making it squares. That also means that these secondary ribs run all the way across and make a strengthening ring around the entire tank, unlike hexagons which zigzag and never have a straight load path. Just think about this tank being pressurized and the whole thing is trying to stretch out. That ring around the middle is then gonna be all in tension, which is very strong, versus a hexagon, which would zigzag back and forth, and like I've shown in my simulations, it's gonna try to straighten out and not be very rigid. Now that's not to say squares are always the best because they're not statically determinant either. It only works on those tanks because they're primarily being loaded in one direction. For other parts where it might be loaded in multiple directions, they actually use triangles. Because like I've mentioned, a triangle is rigid from forces in any direction because it is statically determinant. You can see it has very clear straight lines, straight load paths, which won't try to crumple or straighten out like they would if they were hexagons. So if you wanted to make the perfect honeycomb, you would probably do something that looks more like this. But of course, this is very expensive and wasted a ton of aluminum because they had to mill it out of one giant block. So we usually just use honeycomb. Sometimes hexagons are the okayest agons. Now, while we're here, we might as well look at a few more animations just for fun. I decided to stretch this triangle lattice out and try to demonstrate buckling. I made it super tall and when I hit play, it it clearly buckles. <laughs> now what's happening there is this is way less rigid than steel. Steel is very tightly packed atoms, it's very rigid. This is wet spaghetti. That results in a more complex buckling mode where it sort of forms a sine wave, which is interesting because buckling actually has a lot to do with the vibrational modes of a structure. But anyway, I tried to make this a little more accurate by shortening it so it's a bit more rigid. And then I also made the top joint a roller joint in the vertical direction because when you're pushing with your hand, you're not going to the side, you're going straight down. And that one gave a much more realistic demonstration of the buckling of a ruler. But anyway, just remember that hexagons aren't always the greatest of guns, and I'll see you in the next one.